WRFG's Labor Forum here on uh, every Monday, 4 to 5, and uh, our co-hosts, again, are myself, Diane Mathewitz, John O'Neill, and Paul McLennan, and we have now had Lamont Lilly join us at the table. Lamont is from North Carolina, uh, where he has been, you know, we have, if you're in the movement, you have heard lots and lots of things about all the struggle that has gone on in North Carolina, the kind of Charlotte, it's, I mean, it's just all over the state, um, and uh, the fight against a very right-wing uh, government in the state house. Uh, but Lamont is, there's so many things one could say. He is a poet. He is just, uh, he's in the process of publishing a book of poetry. He's a journalist. Uh, he's a writer and a thinker. But, you know, you got to combine all of that with somebody that acts. And so he's an organizer and an activist. Welcome, Lamont. Uh, thank you for having me on, Diane. You're very welcome. All right. So, um... We had originally said, when I asked you what it is that you really wanted to talk about, because on this program, we try to raise all the issues that impact working and poor people. And so it's called the Labor Forum, which might, for some people, imply that we're only talking about labor unions or labor contracts. But our definition or our purpose here on the Labor Forum is to talk about everything that impacts working and poor people negatively and all the resistance uh, that gives hope that these um, problems that we all encounter can be solved. So we originally were going to talk about mass incarceration, but then Charlottesville happened. And, um, and we knew people, all of us I think here in this room, knew people who actually had gone to Charlottesville to uh, oppose this gathering of some of the most, uh, trying to think of polite, words I can use on the radio, some of the <laughs> most really despicable um, people uh, uh, that live in this country and that profess some of the most vicious hatred and really espouse genocide. Uh, so, so that took place. And so when we, when we were talking again, it was like, how could we segue from Charlottesville and this vicious example of white supremacy that took place, but apply it? to really the everyday um, existence of other kinds of methods of white supremacy, such as mass incarceration. So I sort of laid that out, Lamont. Now, do you want to fly with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I have to share first and foremost, I'm, I, I, I do speak as someone who has had direct contact with the criminal justice system. Um, I would be labeled as, quote-unquote, an ex-felon, um, a charge from 1999, um, you know, for embezzlement, hooking up one of my homeboys at my employee discount. That was complete BS, right? Um, so we see, you know, like the structural issues and, you know, it, there's an intersection between the violence that happened in, in Charlottesville um, with, you know, this white supremacist and the Klan um, against this 32-year-old white woman right, um, Heather Hayer, uh, there's an intersection between that and also the structural state violence of poor black and brown uh, oppressed communities. Um, and I think we have to see that intersection to, uh, to, to completely eradicate all of these conditions um, that, that plague, you know, these communities. Okay, so let's follow up a little bit more on that. Um, some people might say, all right, well, the prison system, that's all government and laws, and these people are outside of that. The existence of this, you know, alt-right, neo-Nazis, Ku Klux Klan, that's all another, that's different and separate. How would you answer somebody who said that? Well, you know, I think we have to dig into the history of how the police um, how the state, you know, was really formed in reference to the control and containment um, of black bodies and African captives here during chattel slavery. So, you know, just just to kind of have a, a, a point of reference here, the police actually began as the slave patrol. Um, the slave patrol here, uh, again, to control, to, to uh, intimidate, to promote fear, and, um, and also to preserve the status quo. Um, right, 
300 years of, of free labor. Um, so we're not just talking about, you know, racism. We're also talking about this intersection between race and also social class here. Um, and so these are two branches of the same tree. We're talking about the Ku Klux Klan. We're talking about Nazis. But then someone would ask, right, well, how is it that when Black Lives Matter and immigrant rights groups, whenever they assemble and, and want to resist for, for people's power, right, um, to change these conditions and dismantle the system, they are met with the most brutal um, repression from the police, um, from the National Guard, um, you know, from state police, from all different types of agencies, from the FBI, um, surveilling, right, you know, Black Lives Matter, which is now very public. Uh, but, but someone would say, well, how come, the, how come the Ku Klux Klan and these white supremacists have basically moved and operated with complete impunity? You know, how come they were not, you know, assaulted and, and brutalized and terrorized by the police? We have to ask ourselves this, and, and the reason why is because, again, these are two branches from the same tree. Yes. So, you know, they both work for the same structure and the same system of white supremacy and to preserve that and to perpetuate that. Um, and I think that is, that, that is the missing intersection that folk are not making. Um, you know, but police terror and, 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 and state violence against black and brown bodies is very, very... Um, it is at the surface. You can see it. It's, it's very obvious, right? You know, it comes on our social media feeds or on our news channels, and it is repulsive when you see that. Um, however, when you talk about mass incarceration and the separation of families, right, and, and uh, continuing to um, create this underclass of people, whether it be ex-felons uh, or whether it be queer and trans folk, right, who cannot provide a living for themselves. Um, all of this is connected, and, and I do believe for us to really resolve these issues and really bring about the change that we, that we, that we all say that we want, we have to begin seeing these connections. I think Paul has a question. We got to move the mic over okay. a little bit. There um, we go. There was a book Michelle Alexander wrote a few years ago uh, called *The New Jim Crow*, and I was wondering if you could talk about how mass incarceration is really a. There's a line starting with slavery coming up to the present that's really a continuation of the the same oppression in different forms. You know, thank you for asking me that question. Um, there's a system that a lot of people are not aware of, um, but if you dig just a little bit in history, you will find the convict lease system. The convict lease system runs parallel um, to the prison industrial complex right now. Um, it was a system during post-reconstruction, there was about a 20 year period after the uh, so-called Emancipation Proclamation in 1865 where African captives and, and, and black folk really did make leaps and bounds of progress in beginning to get, you know, uh, really immersed in the, in the society um, and become first class citizens, right, not second or third class. Um, and so here was this backlash um, in places like Wilmington, North Carolina, where we saw the, uh, the 1898 race riots, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was bombed. Um, there was this backlash. Um, of white supremacy um, in relation to not wanting to see this black progress, right? And so uh, you saw the creation of not only systems like the convict lease system, but you also saw the creation of the paramilitary wing called the Ku Klux Klan. Um, again, two branches of the same tree. And, and from the convict lease system, uh, you also saw the continuation of things like Jim Crow, the, the Jim Crow laws. So again, we're talking about systematic uh, ways uh, that you contain people, you control people, you repress people, you oppress uh, uh, folk. You know, so it's time to get free. I actually have a book here with me uh, by Mumia Abu Jamal called "Have Black Lives Ever Matter." It actually just came out. Um, so you know, check it out, folks. Um, but just a quick passage here, Mumia says, far more dangerous than the white-robed Ku Klux Klan is the legalized malice of the black-robed judiciary. Okay, so we see in one sentence, we see this connection being made uh, by a U.S. political prisoner right now, over 35 years, Mumia Abu-Jamal. 
So again, um, there's a, a statistic that there are now more people, more people of color, more black people, uh, somehow uh, entangled in what is called the justice system, the injustice system, that you in prison, on probation, or on parole, than at the height of chattel slavery. In other words, today's condition of more millions of black men and women uh, is, is, is numerically higher than it was at the height of, of slavery. And I was, again, wanting to kind of make a comparison. There have been, I think last, yesterday, it was noted that there were 700, 800 different protests, whether it was vigils or marches or whatever, across the United States. Uh, and, they, and there probably were more, uh, in response to what happened in Charlottesville. And I want to talk to both all of you about how difficult it is to get people as uh, knowledgeable, as passionate about the fact that there's actually more people uh, who really either work for free or can't work, <laughs> can't get a job. Uh, because of the, the current um, so-called injustice system. So I know Don's got something to say. <laughs> well, that was al almost my next question to Lamont, is how, how do we become better organizers? Um, how do we reach folks, uh, politically educate folks, um, break, I think like we were talking yesterday, break it down so that the hood can understand um, because they're ready and they want to come out. But how do we organize? You know, I think, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to speak directly uh, to the millennials here just for a moment because, you know, as Dr. Huey P. Newton uh, noted, you know, it is the youth who inherit the revolution. Um, and there's been a lot of the youth who have been out in the streets um, and who have been the recipients of, of, of a lot of this brutality uh, and these continued conditions. So. I want to speak directly to them just for a moment and, and then kind of come back to a broad scope. Uh, you know, I think social media is a very, very important, powerful tool because I use it. I'm on Twitter. Um, that's just at Lamont Lilly for folks, you know, who might be on Twitter too. And, and we do use it to organize and raise consciousness um, and, and, and try to like connect these different dots and struggles. But there's no replacement for knocking on doors. We have to get out in our communities, put our feet in the streets, uh, begin to connect with these communities in a very personal, intimate manner. Uh, we have to begin listening to folks, not preaching at sisters and brothers, but listening to them and being patient with folks. We are all on different levels of this thing called consciousness or the movement or, uh, or woke, right, as we call it. Um, and so we have to be patient with folks as we are on different levels. Um, and I think as well we have to make sure that we are being inclusive of all of these various different communities, particularly of like the most oppressed communities. So if we're talking about, you know, the issue of trans lives, you know, being taken out by state violence, right, or, or homophobia, how can you talk about trans lives but you don't have any trans folk at the table? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the issue of uh, 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 inmates coming out, you know, or, or folks who were formerly incarcerated coming out, uh, ex-felons. We're talking about these issues. We have, we build a nonprofit around this around this cause, but there are no ex-felons who are actually in the room. Um, that's an issue. I, that I find that to be very problematic. So we have to make sure that you know all the folks in their representation of all these different struggles sitting at the table, right? Our undocumented community. We need them to be at the table. Um, and, and I think those are just like four, three to four simple steps that we can take. And you know, those, those steps don't cost you anything. It doesn't, it's free to knock on doors. It's free to listen. It's free to be inclusive. It might cost you a little gas to get someplace or a little food after you've done that for four or five hours. But you know, it, it comes with the territory. I have a follow-up question because, again, we, we started out by talking that the labor forum tries to address all the issues important to working and poor people, and, and this is a class-based program, very frankly. You know, we're not going to talk about how hard it is to 
by your second god. Um, so, um, so, so speaking now to the issue of people on their jobs and people who are either in unions or, or not, this question, I think a lot of times uh, on your job, um, people don't necessarily let other folks know that they have somebody in prison in their family. Uh, they may not let somebody know that they have somebody in their family who has AIDS or HIV. I mean, in other words, there are, are lots of issues that are considered um, not, not something to share, but it's only if you uh, become engaged in, I, I guess what I'm talking about is that workers are sometimes are very isolated about their problems because we're all told we're supposed to take care of all these things ourselves. So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that as one of the obstacles, because sometimes people ask us here at the Labor Forum, why are you talking about prisoners? Oh my goodness, talk about a, a working class that's behind bars working for nothing. Mm. Or why is it that you talk about trans people? Talk about people who are workers and mm. work for the least amount of money. So I, again, I want to see if you can help us explain to our listeners why every issue, whether it's um, personal to you or not, is part of the working class struggle. Well, I think you I think you just hit on the fact of, of why it is part of a working class struggle. We're talking about poor people here who are trying to provide for themselves, um, just like we all are, um, and and who are workers, right? You know, when we talk, when we talk about those who are incarcerated, we're talking about folks who are making furniture and license plates and all types of different things for call centers call centers call right? centers <laughs> um, yeah, i'm not really i'm not really i didn't get into the series orange is the new black but you know they're also being employed by corporations right victoria's secrets is just one of them um, so there are many corporations that are making billions of dollars per year off of this off of this labor the slave labor really um, folks are getting paid 25 cents an hour if that um, and so there's no question that this is a very working class issue. Um, I want to go back to, you know, why folks, uh, why some representatives from this community feel isolated. And I think that's a very, very important question. And this is a very important topic that we, that we must uh, really address, particularly within the movement and activists both, because these are the communities that we must be connecting with, right? Um, folks who are living these daily conditions. Um, and very often these folks are shamed, shamed to talk about their history or shamed to talk about their conditions. We have to create the space um, and the love, right, and the patience for them to bring their very different problems to the table. We cannot demonize these, you know, these, this, uh, these histories. We cannot criminalize them. Um, but, you know, you come out um, of an institution, you've done your time, you've paid your restitution, okay. uh, and yet you still can't vote, yet you still can't get an apartment, uh, yet you still can't get a job. Can't uh, get a school loan. Can't get a school loan. So you're basically still incarcerated, you know. I, it, it becomes a lifetime sentence to servitude in third-class citizenship. Um, and I decided... You know, a few years back, particularly when, um, when Ferguson popped off, uh, late 2014, up until that time, I was just a journalist and a poet and a local columnist for my, for my uh, a newspaper in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I was just that, you know, but I began right. to, to, so. to really realize that Have someone been... has to be a voice, particularly for this community. Um, for those who are deemed quote unquote ex felons or those who have had contact with the justice system. Very similar to someone like a Malcolm X, right, who actually used his former conditions, right, to, to be an example to his people of what was possible. Um, particularly when you learn about yourself and you gain a, sen a sense of consciousness, and that consciousness begins to fuel you to be a better servant and a warrior and a soldier to your people for freedom, for justice, for people's power. And um, I just decided that, you know, I needed to, to be that same example. 
Um, there can only be one Malcolm, right? But we can be the best examples that we can be. We can be the, the, uh, the, the most fearless voices that we can be in our own way within our own community. And I find that the more that, that I talk about myself and use my, my own history as an example, uh, the more people, you know, who want to uplift um, the transition and said, you know, actually, uh, wow, you know, I've gone through the same things myself. You know, how did, how did you get to this point? Uh, and so to be able to use my own life as a framework uh, is actually a great honor and a privilege. But it also comes with um, a great deal of duty and responsibility. Uh. I wanted to try to connect another dot um, around the issue of violence. Mm. Um, we saw violence take place in Charlottesville that were connecting to uh, racial oppression, um, the Nazis. We uh, talk about patriarchal uh, mm. forms of violence. Come on now. And in the same, what I'm trying to connect here too is the war issue of violence that this country has um, so much of its history tied, tied into and what we're hearing about North Korea and Venezuela and the militarization of the, of the police, uh, the exchange program that we have here between Georgia State and the Israeli government training local police. Could you talk about uh, to pull the lens out globally, uh, how this is connected. You know, um, I believe it was H. Rat Brown, uh, formerly H. Rat Brown, now Jamil El Amin, who said that violence is as American as apple pie. And, you know, this country was actually founded on violence, right? Um, violence as in the genocide of the indigenous, uh, Native Americans. Uh, much love and respect, by the way, to the folks at Standing Rock who are still um, fighting for their sovereignty and autonomy. Um, you know, and we are violent at both at home and abroad. Um, we are violent in Africa, we are violent in the Middle East, um, we've been violent um, throughout Asia, we are violent in, in, in South America, right? Um, and, and not to get like too, too deep and too philosophical, but you know, that's imperialism, that's colonialism, but at home, you know, there's also uh, um, the same police uh, carry out those same duties as like the U.S. military. And I'm speaking from, as a perspective, from someone who is former military. I was four years, I served four years in the, in the U.S. Army um, from 97 to 01, so I don't speak from, um, you know, a blind uh, perspective here. This violence is, is it is being a, it is an issue that has gone on for too long now worldwide. Um, whether it's violence against women, right? You know, at the hands of men, domestic violence. Um, whether it's by violence against black and brown folk uh, or poor people, or whether it's uh, you know violence abroad against other countries who are seeking sovereignty and independence. Um, not to say that we're going to always agree uh, with how folks run their country, but that's not that's not the issue. That's not our responsibility to agree with how foreign governments run their country uh, because we certainly don't have democracy right here in the United States. Um, we, we go around, we have a thousand military bases, 1,000 military bases spread out around this world um, under, the, under the auspices um, of democracy. But folk right here in the U.S. will tell you we don't, we've never experienced any democracy. All we've experienced is, is hypocrisy. You know, and that same violence is the same, the same violence that has been perpetuated over centuries um, is the same violence that, uh, that manifested itself this past weekend. 32-year-old uh, again, Heather Hayer, uh, as James Field ran his car through a crowd, right? Here, here was a white woman um, who was there to support the movement and there to stand in resistance against racism and white supremacy. So this violence, you know, very often, you know, it, we see it on black and brown folk and poor folk, but this violence is going to start, you know, manifesting on all different types of levels. You know, and there, there's, a, there's a quote that says, in the morning they come for me, but in the night they will come for you. 
you know, in a, I think as working class communities and, and working class folk of all different nationalities, we have to keep that in mind and um, we have to begin standing in solidarity, um, you know, with each other and with our communities. So we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I'll give you a chance, Lamont, to talk a little bit about your books. Because there might be people who are going thinking, wow, he's really very eloquent. He said some really good things. I'd like to follow, I'd like to know him better. Well, um, I do. <laughs> this is the uh, actually kind of embarrassing part, uh, I, you know. But it, either way, I, I do have a, a book coming out. Um, the first book is called "Right to Rebel: uh, Movement Writings of a Black Radical." Uh, it's a collection of different different writings of my own from 2011 uh, to 2017. Uh, 2011 being, you know, the uh, the initial spark of the Occupy movement, right? And we're talking about Wall Street. Um, I was actually there in Zuccotti Park in 2011. And it goes all the way down to, to Ferguson and what's happening uh, in Baltimore and what's happening, uh, you know, right now in Atlanta, right? You know, with Jamarion Robinson. Um, and so it's, it's interviews, it's commentary, um, it's a little bit of everything uh, that encapsulates the last several years of the movement. It's political, it's also cultural at the same time. We talk about jazz and hip hop and dissect, you know, how art and activism intersect. Um, and the second book is a book of poetry. It's called Honor in the Ghetto, uh, Poems and Verse of the Negro Spirit. And it'll be out in about six, seven months after Right to Rebel. But both books have already been written. Both books have already been edited. And uh, I'm very proud to say both books were born from the movement. Um, not from a classroom, but actually being out in the street um, with the people, uh, you know, with a very working class uh, consciousness uh, to it. Thank you so much, Lamont. Uh, we are at the end of our program. Uh, listeners, I hope you truly enjoyed and appreciated everything that Lamont Lilly had to say. And I guess you can Google him or whatever on Facebook and whatever he will pop up someplace. He is an active social media uh, presence. I want to thank uh, again Christopher Hollis at the Engineering Board, Dawn O'Neill, Paul McLennan, co-host Ozzy Ibrahimi for videoing. And we'll be back again next Monday. This is Diane Mathewitz saying goodbye for today uh, here from the Labor Forum. And please do stay tuned to all the other programming that's here on WRFG 89.3 FM.